So during 2023 and 2024, I completed eight consecutive PED experiments where I performed lab work before and after. I thought I'd compile all the experiments into one video and provide you guys the most notable biomarker and physique transformations. So some of the lab work looked great, some more debatable. The first experiment began January 24th, 2023. This was primarily a testosterone boosting experiment. So I implemented a double dosage of blue and black ox testosterone boosters. My baseline testosterone at this time was quite low. It was 356 nanograms per deciliter. And by February 11th, my testosterone doubled to 717 nanograms per deciliter. So those results certainly exceeded my expectations. I considered it a very successful experiment. Now my estrogen also doubled from 17.9 to 36.9 but I experienced no estrogenic side effects, so I didn't really consider that concerning. The next experiment, it overlapped with the first, so I began taking MK677 February 1st. The first five days I took 10 milligrams daily and then increased the dosage to 20 milligrams. During this time period, I was also taking blue ox, black ox, creatine, terkestrone, arachidonic acid, epicatechin, and then also slim pills to counteract any decrease in insulin sensitivity from the MK677. And by March 7th, I made quite the dramatic physique transfer I gained around 20 pounds. Now, most of this was indeed water weight from the MK677, but I believe I also gained a couple pounds of muscle tissue as well. The most intriguing biomarker transformation was the growth hormone increase. It skyrocketed from 1.25 on January 24th to 18.8 .8 on March 7th. But because growth hormone dramatically fluctuates throughout the day as it's released in pulses, these two growth hormone measurements were not really necessarily indicative of my average growth hormone increase. A better indicator of the increase in growth factors from the MK677 is IGF-1. So IGF-1 remains far more stable throughout the day and gradually increases increases during an MK677 cycle. My IGF-1 increased from 142 to 314. Based on the MK677 studies, 20 milligrams per day is expected to increase IGF-1 somewhere between 50 and 75%, so I do appear to be somewhat of a hyper responder. My HbA1c or average blood sugar, which is a valid proxy for insulin resistance, actually improved from 5.5% to 5.3%. This meant that the increase in insulin sensitivity from the slim pills more than counterbalanced the decrease in insulin sensitivity from the MK677. Around February 14th, I also incorporated a low dosage of the pro hormone 3AD, just two pills daily. Looking back, this low dosage of 3AD probably didn't exert too much of an effect. In May, I performed a 3AD experiment at triple that dosage. So I consider that more insightful. I'll go over that more and we'll get to that soon. Now, during this time period, my liver enzymes actually significantly increased. So AST increased from 27 to 44 and ALT increased from 19 to 35. And this was somewhat concerning to me, even though my enzymes still remained within the healthy reference range, but it was entirely possible that this liver enzyme elevation was due to the significant increase in training intensity rather than the supplements. So liver enzymes can become elevated due to an increase in muscle breakdown and not necessarily from liver damage. And because my liver enzymes remained fairly stable throughout the other experiments that entire year, it does appear that my liver enzymes correlated more with my training intensity and not any specific supplement. The next lab work I performed was on March 28th. This was after three weeks of 20 milligrams daily of the SARM AC262. The prior testosterone measurement was 600 on March 7th. This was a slight decrease from 717 on February 11th, which makes sense because I switched from a double dosage of blue and black ox testosterone boosters to a single dosage. And then on March 28th, after the AC262, my testosterone was 558. A 40 nanograms per deciliter decrease in testosterone is not going to be subjectively noticeable. And because, of course, testosterone does fluctuate somewhat throughout the day, I could not deem that as sufficient evidence that AC262 suppressed my testosterone whatsoever, especially because at this point, my estrogen actually peaked. If AC262 was suppressing the HPTA axis, you would expect estrogen to be somewhat suppressed as well, but it was not. My baseline estrogen before any of these experiments was 18, and by this point, it was 72 but I still was not experiencing any estrogenic side effects whatsoever. In fact, the only experiment where I felt the toll of high estrogen was during my HCG experiment, which we'll get to, but by then my estrogen was actually lower. So how does this make sense? Well, my best theory is that my high estrogen on paper was due to the estrogen modulators, DIM and indole 3 carbonyl in black ox. One of the mechanisms through which they positively balance estrogen 
is by increasing the conversion of the milder, more beneficial estrogen metabolite 2OH and decreasing the conversion of the stronger, more detrimental estrogen metabolite 16-alpha-OH. So because of this phenomenon, it's possible for the estrogen on paper to increase while the overall estrogenic activity actually remains stable or even decreases. And the HCG experiment, which we'll discuss soon, actually confirmed this theory. But first, experiment four was the 3AD experiment. So I took two pills three times daily for three weeks and performed my next lab work on May 23rd. My testosterone increased to 733, which was significantly higher than my previous measurement of 558. Now at this point, my LDL cholesterol was a little bit higher. So 124 compared to the previous measurement of 95 and the baseline of 82.4 before any of the experiments. But similar to the liver enzyme elevation, I couldn't really find a correlation between any specific supplement and cholesterol changes. One particular contradiction was that on March 28th, the first time I discontinued 3AD and implemented the SARM AC262, my triglycerides increased from 31 to 54, but on June 17th, the next time I discontinued a higher dose of 3AD and implemented a higher dosage of AC262, my triglycerides were lower, only 46. So to me, it appeared that my cholesterol levels were more correlated with diet changes than supplement changes. Now, experiment five, that was the 30 milligram daily AC262 experiment that ended on on June 17th. My testosterone was 640, which was actually higher than many of my measurements earlier in the year. And my LH, luteinizing hormone, which is an endogenous testosterone producing hormone, was the highest it's ever been, 5.18, which was somewhat confounding because if anything, SARM should suppress LH and FSH, which would have the downstream effect of suppressing testosterone. So my theory here is that because of 3AD's adrenal metabolism, it can work in a way where it doesn't suppress the HPTA axis, and it also can alter the body's equilibrium in reference to testosterone. So the theory is my body became acclimated to the higher testosterone from 3AD, and then when I discontinued it, my body attempted to maintain equilibrium by increasing the testosterone-producing hormone LH. Here's how I was looking during this experiment. Certainly leaner than the fluffy physique that I had during the beginning of the year after I first implemented MK677. Now experiment six, ending July 26th after 10 days on HCG 1000 IUs every third day. This was another testosterone boosting experiment. During this experiment, I attempted to limit the variables at play by discontinuing blue and black ox testosterone boosters. My testosterone did increase to the highest so far at this time period, 870 nanograms per deciliter. So HCG was certainly effective in this regard, but I felt terrible during this experiment. I experienced brain fog, lethargy, and water retention, all of which are estrogenic side effects, which is why I discontinued HCG after only 10 days. But my estrogen actually decreased to 51, the lowest it had been since February 11th. So this confirms my theory about the DIM and indole 3 carbonyl in black ox. Because I discontinued black ox, those estrogen balancing agents were no longer enhancing the conversion to the weaker, more beneficial estrogen metabolite. So even though estrogen was lower on paper, overall estrogenic activity was most likely higher. Next, experiment seven, ending February 11th, 2024, after a couple months of 6.25 milligrams daily of enclomiphene, another endogenous testosterone boosting experiment. For this experiment, I discontinued all other supplements to minimize the variables at play, so I was just running enclomiphene in isolation. My testosterone increased to the highest it's ever been in my life, 1,120. Now my estrogen was 51, the same estrogen level that elicited the estrogenic side effects during my HCG experiment. But again, the estrogen on paper here is slightly misleading. Why? Because enclomiphene's mechanism of action is blocking some of the estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus. This signals to the brain to produce more gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which has the downstream effect of producing more LH, FSH, and thereby testosterone and estrogen. So although serum estrogen is higher, not all of that estrogen is bioavailable because enclomiphene is blocking a significant proportion of that estrogen in the brain. So I did not experience any estrogenic side effects during this enclomiphene experiment. In fact, I felt great, much better than baseline, in fact. Now, my SHBG did increase. My average was around 30 during the other experiments, and by the end of this experiment, it was 50. So it's possible my high testosterone level was slightly less bioavailable, you could say. But I certainly felt like my testosterone was significantly higher than my average testosterone during these experiments, which was around six to 700. Now, depending on someone's goals, a common concern with enclomiphene is the potential decrease in IGF-1. 
but I didn't seem to experience this. Remember, I discontinued all other supplements, including MK677 for this experiment, but my IGF-1 was 187, which was actually the exact same as it was February 11th, 2023, after 10 days on MK677. So how did my IGF-1 remain above baseline while on enclomiphene? I'm not sure, but it does highlight the significance of individual variability. Here's how my physique looked during this enclomiphene experiment. This was probably the leanest I have ever been outside of a contest prep. The high testosterone from enclomiphene allowed me to shred down fairly effortlessly. And finally, experiment number eight. So in this experiment, I decreased the dosage of enclomiphene to only 3.125 milligrams per day, but reincorporated a single dosage of blue and black ox. The idea here was to implement a testosterone boosting protocol that had an extremely low propensity for side effects by substituting some enclomiphene with the testosterone boosters that increased testosterone through different mechanisms. My estrogen remained about the same 53 and my testosterone was 998 by the end of the experiment which I was quite pleased with. And this is the testosterone boosting protocol that I continue to run to this day, although I've also experimented with top T instead of blue and black ox as well. So those are all of the experiments I've run where lab work was performed. I hope you guys found at least some of these experiments insightful. Let me know what you think of them in the comment section below, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.